Now we know why. Yesterday we talked about the speed heaters, and we use these a lot. And again, I'll, I'll re repeat this for the folks that were here. We tend to use these. Oh yeah. We use these on on every era of house. But we specifically use these mostly on Victorian era because the, the nails were set below the surface and then filled with glazing putty. And, and so this will work on anything. The tool that, uh, that Avery just set up over here is called a paint shaver. Oh, sorry. <laughs> All right, so what this is is a Hitachi grinder body. Okay. And the guy with American Tool, American Tool Company, invented this head. And it's got three cutters on it. And each one of these is carbide, and they're made out of uh, uh, in a triangle. Mm -hmm. So if you chip one point of the triangle or wear it down, you've got two more points that you can turn it to. It adjusts in thousands in and out. It adjusts in thousands up and down. Because what it does is it takes the paint off the face of the clapboard and the butt edge above it oh, at the same time. Yeah. So this is the butt edge. Yeah, I get it, I get it. And this is the face. Right. As soon as we get some electricity, I gotta show you. So this tool can ruin clapboard, right. or it can, it can do a really great job. You have to play with it in an out of the way spot. <laughs> if you're, you know, I've never used that so that you know what you're doing. But it goes in a hose to the half of that, so you're not sucking all the old paint. So, this clapboard is very cup. <coughs> so it's, it, it, it's cupped like this instead of in. And it varies from board to board, but most of this is cupped to the outside, which makes it a l actually a little simpler to do this. When, whenever I'm do using that tool, <coughs> roll of sandpaper. Head out here. Oh, okay. Right in front of my face. <laughs> I keep a, 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 one of these 100 grit in my back pocket, and then after I do a section, I just basically wipe it like this, and that's all you need to do. Now you can buy; they also sell a sander, so that after you shave all the paint off, then you can take the sander and go over it. Um, but I find that just swiping it a little bit with, with the 100 grit seems to work really fine. So if you want to go out and take a peek at that and see. Mm -hmm. It doesn't like face nail clapboard, which is what we've got here. Because it'll catch mm -hmm. on That's why I went between the nails. The nails. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it'll bust Boy. up the carbide. So <laughs> people out here with two of those tools, mm -hmm. they can do a whole side, a whole side in almost a day. Okay. I just want to scrape off the loose bits. Sand it down and then paint it. If you don't have multiple paint layers, you can do that. Okay. If you have multiple paint layers, I mean, there's a lot of paint on this. And so the problem and is. One of the things that we have is we, it looks like we have underlying oil and we have latex on top. And you can see how the latex has failed because of the contraction mm -hmm. expansion of the paint films are completely different. Now, one of the ways that you can uh, rags. Avery. This is actually a Tyvek suit. Oh, I always hold on one of those. So, <laughs> here's why, if I'm doing a lot of this work, I put this on. It's got a hood, and it's got, you can put mashed potatoes in the feet, like, like you know. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and it keeps your clothes from getting dust all over them. Um, the reason I went to this is because mm. every time my, my little kids lived in every house, we would move in carve out a space to live in and I would work on the house. Well, I don't want them to get lead poisoned, so I would do all my stripping in a room and I put plastic on both sides of the door jam with offset slits 
I have a fan in the window. I would do my work and then I would strip down to my boxers, put my clothes in a garbage bag and take them to, down to the laundry. Well, one day I was doing a house that had an exterior basement entrance to the laundry. So I got down to my boxers, I had my bag, and I climbed out the window and the little old lady next door called the cops. There's a naked man climbing out of Mr. Yap's house with his boxer shorts and a bag full of stolen stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so I sat in a cop car for a couple minutes and he went, okay, I get what you're doing. Don't do it again. Like, Don't be stealing clothes. Yeah, right. So then I bought a bunch of those Tyvek suits and those work out pretty well. So there's that. Now, uh, Avery, let's get one of the um, speed heaters over there. Get that set up. Which one's the best? Um, it depends. Like I said, this can be done on any era of house. I would not use this tool on this building because of all the face nailing, because it'll, it'll chip off those carbide cutters. But I wanted to show you how it works just real quick. Can't hammer in the nails? Uh huh? Can't well, you, you head take head a headed nail and try to set it below the surface, <laughs> and it will uh, uh, pierce the wood and, uh, and cause rot. All it, right. You know. okay. But if you have a headed, uh, a trim nail, yeah. there's a difference. So I'll show you here. So this is called a hot dip galvanized box nail, and it has a head on it, uh -huh. and that's sort of basically what they've been using here. And um, but we don't, I don't know about the rest of the structure. So this is a number six galvanized. That's a number four that I just showed you, and this is a number six, which is more likely what they used on this particular house. Uh -huh. Um, that size. Then you've got a six, number six um, finish nail, which is right here, and that's about the same length as the box nail. And I, that's how I put clapboard on that, or with this gun. And we use these nails. A little longer than this. They're literally almost the same gauge as this nail, close, and they're also galvanized, and it makes your your life go a lot faster when you're using a, a gun like that that's not tethered to a compressor. Oh yeah. yeah. Because you can trip over them. You're trying to climb up on scaffold or a ladder. <laughs> these uh, these battery operated and or gas and battery operated guns I think are just fantastic. You saw how fast I put that yeah. case in the back yesterday. Um, it, it's pretty amazing. So before I do this though, I, I, there was one other thing I wanted to show you. How do you know what's on the house as far as is it latex or is it oil, right? And there is a can right here. This is goop off. You know, and boy, this is some smelly stuff. Yes, it is. Yeah. You don't want to be in a closed room. No, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> but it will tell you if you have latex or oil. Really? Because it only takes off latex. Okay. So, I'm going to come up on this. It's definitely a latex on top. This, I've got some of it coming off on here. Plus, I've got the mold underneath. I mean, this is just a this is a nightmare. Mm -hmm. and, and it's not s s done well. I mean, if you if you look at this, I mean, yeah, it's, it's all me. <laughs> this would never be done. Every other board, almost in line with a joint, as water comes down, it's just going to go into every single joint. You want to offset your joints a long way from each other when we're siding, and, uh, and and they've done it again here as well. And here, this was probably a door at one time. And they patched this in. This morning, uh, we, we were sticking our fingers in here. Now let's let's take a peek at it. So the nice thing is that this is, it was designed for six inch flat board. 
You can see that the fin is just below right. and right up to the one above it. And specifically designed for that. Now you can really see this, the saw marks here. Yeah, I can. You know? This is problematic because it's so rough that the paint's getting down into the saw marks so it's, it's virtually impossible to get it all off. And I just don't, I just not believing that this is all original. This wood looks to me to be, it is not, it looks to me to be almost a hardwood. Um, like elm or something like that. And um, that's a problem too. Here's the thing about wood. <laughs> Hardwoods have tannic acid in them. Tannic acid will impede pain adhesion. I mean, this has had pain problems for years. And as we walk around it, you'll see that it's even worse in other areas. Um, so I see people using poplar outside. I see people using walnut on sills and things like that. Um, it will not hold paint. And I'll give you an example. Pine Mountain Settlement School that I was talking about in the Appalachian Mountains yesterday. Beautiful lodge house where they have the old ladies in house coats with segmented trays and you know I mean oh, come wow. on man. It, you know it's as classic as it gets right. Um, so anyway over the entry into the thing was a big gigantic white oak uh, bean lentil beam over the entry into this lodge and it had been there since 1909 perfect condition the uh, staff decided this vinyl side the original structure this is before we got down there and they painted this lentil beam within a year and a half that lentil beam was completely rotted because it doesn't hold paint paint the water moisture gets trapped behind the the film and it rotted that beam out. Oh, so hardwoods are not something we use. So what is a hardwood? Anybody know what a hardwood, what it means to be a hardwood? Mm, it's uh, deciduous. deciduous trees, leaf bearing trees. Poplar is very soft but it's a hardwood. It's soft um, when it comes first cut, right? And then it becomes a hardwood as it transitions to dry. When it becomes dry. You no, no. Uh, poplar, uh, uh, so the designation softwood and hardwood is all based on leaf or needle bearing. Is it? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And, and and there's a there's a myth out there that somebody put some uh, lolly pine joists in my house and they're so hard I can't get a 16 penny nail into it because it's hardened over time. That doesn't that isn't true. It doesn't harden over time. It's just hard hard old pine or fir or what have you. Uh, older growth. The older growth it is, the harder it is because it's more dense and the grain lines are tighter. Um, so, um, hardwoods are something you can have. That's why you'll see that most clapboard on city type structures are either, are either pine, this is, this is pine, or they're cedar. I see some cypress up in Hannibal, but that had to be uh, keel boated up to Hannibal from you know Mississippi or Louisiana. This is a hardwood of some sort and it's probably adding to its inability to hold paint well. We're gonna uh, we're gonna do after lunch we're gonna do a, some clapboard replacements and all kinds of things but let's talk about lead for a minute. Lead paint was invented back in the 1800s and I, I should have brought that little can. I threw, I threw it at, at Avery and he caught it. He went, oh my God, it's a little tiny pint can that weighs an entire pound. So you'd buy white lead and there were, there were lead wars back in the 1800s between Sherwin Williams and, and, and Dutch Boy and these other companies. Our, 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 our white lead is strictly pure, way better than their lead. <laughs> And it, so you buy this white paste and you'd mix in linseed oil and different turpentines and things like that and create your and pigments and create paint. And that's how they did it in the, in the early years. Um, and, you know, when we talk about, I talk a lot about solid contents, resin, stuff like that. Heavy metal, shit, that, that's as good a solid content as you can get. It's dangerous for a lot of different reasons. But it was, it was an incredibly great paint.
it just was. And uh, but we just can't use it anymore. It's just not, not feasible. Um, we do a lot of exterior wood repairs. We do one of two things. We do what's called a Dutchman repair, or we can do epoxy. So a Dutchman repair. So if you have a, if you're looking down on a big sill, and you've got a whole bunch of rot, and the sill used to come here, that would not be a sill that we would use epoxy. Because that's what we call putty gooping, epoxy putty gooping. You're trying to create a, a one foot area of epoxy. And it's just insane to use it for that because this is what we call a two gallon kit. So when I buy this, I buy in larger volume. You buy pint kits, pour kits of this Abitron, uh, which I think is in your handouts, I'm pretty sure it is. The, um, the two gallon kit. So you get a gallon of A, a gallon of B, and it creates two gallons of putty. You get a can, a gallon can of liquid A and a liquid B, and it creates two gallons. So we call it two gallon kit. It's delivered just under 400 bucks. <laughs> now, if I didn't have students, a two gallon kit would last me for three ground up restorations. Because I'm not a putty duper. I don't do what I just described here. So, on this case, I would take this sill and I would back cut it like this. Yeah. And then I would take another piece of old growth that's the same species mm -hmm. and I would splice it onto yeah. that. I might even put a, a spline in it, which is another piece of wood in a groove mm -hmm. to hold the two pieces together. Then, if I had a little bit of gap in here, I might fill it with epoxy. Um, but, you know, my joints don't have to happen. Um, so, Dutchman repairs are really important. And the glue that we use outdoors is Type Bond 3. It is Type Bond 3. It is not Type Bond 2, which is water resistant. You don't want water resistant, you want water proof. And that's what this is. And even if it gets moisture on it, it stays sticky. I mean, it really is, it contracts and expands with the wood. It's really the best outdoor glue that there is. I want to backtrack just a second because I had a really good point that was made about duration. Now that I don't want to forget this, that we talked about never using on the outside of houses, right? If you need to create a vapor barrier on the interior side, which is where a vapor barrier goes, duration has in uh, in interior products that if you've blown insulation into the side walls of your house, so you can use it on the, so if you have blown in insulation, you need to create a vapor barrier on the planet. Um, yeah. So you can create a vapor barrier. There's also a company called uh, Specification Chemical in Boone, Iowa, that makes a thing called New Wall. And so if you have a plaster wall with lots of hairline cracks, but they're not offset, they're just cracks everywhere, or you've got milk paint on a wall, which you can't paint over, it's, uh, it's really difficult to paint over. They make this fiberglass matting that goes up like wallpaper, huh. and, and it's the it's the paint. You put paint on in a four foot swath, a little over four foot, and you put this fiberglass matting in, and the paint is the glue, and then you overlap the next piece onto it, and then you just cut it out, and perfectly invisible seam, and then you paint over it with their elastomeric coating, and it creates the, it bridges over all the cracks in the walls, and it creates a permanent vapor barrier on the plaster wall. Mm -hmm. Nice new wall, N U W A L, new wall. Uh, they make some other products too. They make roof coatings, recycled rubber roof coatings oh. that you can roll on or spray on. Um, I've actually used their products to reline leaking old turn metal built-in gutters. Um, yeah. So Dutchman repairs are what we do a lot of, and I keep a lot of salvaged wood. Now I don't know if you have a salvage operation anywhere near here other than St. Louis. You're, 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 it's salvage. my daughter. Yeah. It's, it's my daughter. Share. Does everybody know about this? <laughs> Tell us about it, please. Well, I mean, Greg Gilbert runs a local yeah. business yeah. where he takes mm -hmm. down barns and uh, resalvages it, or I don't say resalvages it, salvages it. Right. Yeah. yeah. He was using that building for storage, wasn't Correct. he? Correct. Yep. Is he still? No. No, he's over at the Philpest, isn't he? No, he's, well, he owns that building, but that's not where the wood salvage is. So, if you've blown insulation into your house and you don't want to 
take it out. <laughs> um, you can go and buy these. These are a little louvered vents. You take the plastic mm -hmm. plugs out, you put these in. If your insulation's wet, it will help dry the insulation out. That's what I had in mind. Oh, don't fall. And you can get them with little screens inside of them, too. Yeah. So bugs can't get in. Yeah. Yeah. And oh bigger for when And you can paint those so they blend out. So you just have the holes in the. I have plugs. Plastic like a, plugs. I made a handrail that looks like this. Oh. And you've got balusters coming down. And then you got another flat board here. This, this is going to be gone. Because water comes down and just sits on this. Water comes down and sits on this. Mm -hmm. So on my handrails, I'm doing uh, usually they almost look like this. Maybe some beaded stuff here, like that. And then the balusters come down, and then this has got the same pitch. I'm exaggerating the pitch a little bit, but just to get so water sheds off of it. <laughs> so I'm watching Jose and trying to advise him across the street because they hired him to restore his porch. The porch, and I'm like, well, I don't know. Jose can paint. So they 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 had rot on the top of the railing for obvious reasons. And this is what I pulled out of it. Now, this is not Bondo. It's concrete. Oh. Oh my God. <laughs> I mean, I can't make some of this stuff up, so I save all this stuff to show people. This is architectural epoxy. You ready? Light? Yeah, so, so that's a student, after I gave the lecture, never make more than you're going to need. She came around the corner with a ball this big of it. And of course, that, you know, that was left. It's very expensive. Right. And it shapes up really easily, saws, it holds screws, it contracts and expands similar to the wood. And it was all invented by a fascist Italian guy that worked for Mussolini. <laughs> what was this? The handrail. There was a big rot spot on the top of the handrail and that was what we pulled out of it. Some you can see the wood grain and the rotted wood grain in it below. Yeah. So that and Bondo are not good. The reason we don't use Bondo when I'm restoring a car, the last car I restored was a 67 Volvo P1800 sports car, which is like a little, little fins on it. Um, we didn't put any Bondo on it. We, we, there, any metal that was bad, we cut it out and we welded new metal in. And, and because Bondo, in car restoration, doesn't contract and expand with the metal, and it pops out, and it's just it's not a good fix, right? Same thing with, with uh, houses. Bondo absorbs moisture. It doesn't, like, repel it. So that's why this architectural epoxies are so important to use. And there's one called West Systems that was designed to use on boats. So this is, this is the go-to epoxy that almost all of us use. West Systems was designed strictly for wooden boats here in the States, which is great, but it's not a 50-50 mix, A and B. You've got to have specialized percentages and all these cartridges that squirt out just, and it's very tough to use and it cannot be shaped. So when you put it into rot or what have you, it has to be exactly as you want it to be when you're done. So that, you know, it's got to be smoothed off with the wood around it, usually wax papers put into the surface of it. And it's very, very, uh, 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 it's very technical, and it's not any better than this, and it works better. It's very rubbery, so you can't, it just, it just, and there are some circumstances where that's good, but in most cases you want, you want something like that, like this, that will contract and expand with the wood, and you shape it with chisels, carbide scrapers, sanders, you know, you can clean it. What comes off in shavings, just like wood. Um, it's a very interesting product that uh, I like to use a lot. Um, let's talk a little bit about caulking. One of the things, so when we strip a house, the, the other test that we did, we don't live in LA. 
where they have pollution. You can just stand in Pasadena and look down into the valley and it's just like, you can't even see the buildings, it gets so bad. But we have more airborne particulates than you know. <laughs> Farming, factories in our communities, all these different ways that we get all these airborne particulates. In my town, it's still like the sand in there because we have the largest Portland cement factory in the country and we have more upper respiratory problems in Hannibal and it's just being uh, uh, discovered that it's coming from the cement plant. And Olive's going, God, I'm so glad I left Hannibal. Well, we've got we the lawnmowers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, leaf blowers, that's my favorite, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, really? Let's get some gasoline and That's leaf what my blow. neighbors in Hannibal mm -hmm. were. Um, so airborne particulates are issues, so I wanted to find out what was going on. So we took one side of a house and we stripped it down to the bare wood, we cleaned it, we let it dry for three days so it was below 15% and then we oil primed it. Then we went to site two, we did the same thing, site three, site four, and then we're back about six weeks later to the site that we did first. So we took a section of that out and a section that we had just done and we sent that to a lab. And I wanted to know two things. How much, how much, what, what's the airborne particulate that's on that primer that we did six weeks earlier compared to what we've just done, and how would that affect adhesion? Well, it was astonishing to me how much airborne particulates were on that primer. And it did affect adhesion by like three times less adhesion because of that. Oh so what's the, what's the solution? Well, reclean the primer would be one of them, but it's simpler to just do one side of a house at a time. So whenever I'm doing a project, we strip the house, we set up the scaffolding on one side, we strip it, clean it, we prime it, we paint it, we prime it, then we caulk it, and then we paint it. And we avoid that issue of that extra yeah. six weeks of, uh, of the potential for airborne particulates to get on the house. So I'm all, I want to do everything I can to make my paint jobs last long. Oh, that would be awesome. So, uh, when we strip a house and we clean it and we make sure that the moisture content is below 15%, then we, we prime with the oil-based primer, and then we caulk. You never caulk before you prime. Now, what did we do to those glazing beds before we put the uh, linseed oil in, into them yesterday? Nothing. Sanded. Sanded. Linseed oil. We, we did 50% linseed oil yeah, that, and denatured alcohol to seal that bed so it wouldn't suck the oil out of the putty. Same yeah. thing with caulk. You have to be primed before you caulk, otherwise it'll suck the oils out of the caulk and it will shrink. It's the same thing. So you never caulk bare wood. Um, epoxy is just the opposite. It has to be bare wood. There can't be any paint on it at all. Because then you prime it and then you can caulk around it or what have you. So I have a question. Yeah. I have some sash that I was working on on my building and I didn't quite, well, I've already got it primed with an auto-based primer. I primed the, the bed, the putty bed, the glass bed. I, I do that. Oh, you prime, okay. I prime, so we couldn't do that yesterday because it's a one-day class. And the primer is long oil and it takes, you know, overnight to, Sure. Mm -hmm. But I, uh, Avery and I, uh, so Avery, how, how do you handle our, our bare wood sashes once we get them stripped? You finish sand them and then you prime the whole thing. Before you set your door. Yeah. Before you set Because that, that seals yeah. the bed. Right. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's what I want to We take yeah. one more step on our primer that a lot of people don't do. The 320 sandpaper. We take 320 sandpaper and lightly scuff over the primer. Just to get the tooth. Just to give a little yeah. tooth. Well, it gets, you know, we try not to paint out of a can. We try to pour it into a container. But sometimes we end up going out of a can, and every time you put the brush in, it's got some goobers in it. Yeah. And, and so the 320 just kind of takes it off, especially on the interior sides where you want your paint finishes to be so smooth. Uh, the 320 sandpaper, just a wipe over it. I don't think you have to sand that hard do you? He just finished this gigantic job. I, could, I, I probably said this yesterday, but he did a great job. Is that all right? I did. He's so verbose, man. He, let's do some questions here before lunch. And I don't care what it's about. 
I'm <laughs> serious. If it's about an old building or an old house, ask me the question. Let's do this. This, we got, wait, this is a lot more leisurely today than it was yesterday. <laughs> we don't have anything that we have to finish by the end of the day. No, no, no project. The whole we're going to patch in some building. siding here and there, and we're going to try some architectural proxies. We might even get you out of here mid, mid, midday if, if, if everybody behaves. You said that Bondo holds moisture? It absorbs it. Yeah, so that's why Bondo bad. We don't use Bondo. I did it on the first house I ever did. I had to go back five years later. I didn't have to. I went back to visit the house. Everything was great, except all the Bondo patches were failing. And I had just discovered architectural epoxy. So I sent myself and my apprentice at the time, and we went over and took it all out. And I was back there about two years ago. I sold that house in 1974. And I went back a couple years ago, and all those epoxy patches were still good. That's a long time, and when you uh, when you get to be geezerly like me, you get to see stuff in the field. It's been there a long time. You know, John Leak, my colleague out in Maine, who's from Nebraska, so he's okay. You know, uh, he uh, his standard is 20 years in the field. Sometimes that's not possible. You know, you find something really good. So accelerated testing is another way to approach things. So you go into a lab and you, and you take putty and you throw <coughs> sleet and rain at it in a controlled environment and different humidities and that kind of thing. That can be another way to get to that point. So, yeah. Temperatures. Yeah, exactly. And they do that in the window industry all the time. Uh, they will never sell you a window based on air infiltration. You will never see anything on a new window talk about stopping air infiltration because they, they don't. They're terrible. And they'll talk about U value, they'll talk about, they used to talk about R value. In 2011, the Federal Trade Commission came out and fined all the major window companies in this country a lot and said, you are claiming 40, 50, 60 percent energy savings and you have absolutely no science. In fact, all the science says the best. Ready? Uh -huh. Don't do it. <laughs> Treated lumber has so many chemicals oh, in it, yeah. it will not hold paint. When I got to Hannibal, the ordinance, the preservation guidelines specifically said that all exterior wood repairs should be done with treated wood. <laughs> and, and so people have been doing it. <laughs> Of course, it was all failing, and the paint won't adhere to it for any length of time. Now, if you let it sit for about a year, and you put oil primer on it, some of that evaporates out of the wood, and it'll hold paint for a few years, but not for very long. So it's just, if you're going to use, tree, I use a lot of treated lumber, but I use it underneath porches, and then I wrap things with western red cedar or cypress or what have you. So that what, what you're actually seeing is not the treated wood. The painting is very problematic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What's been your experience? Well, it peels off. Yeah, it does peel <laughs> off. <laughs> but I've heard to paint it with wood, uh, fire and wood seed oil. Let that sit on there for a minute. Yeah, yeah. yeah. the so if you, if you let it sit for a while let, and let it gas out, and then you put boiled linseed, not raw, but boiled linseed oil on it, and then oil prime it uh, after that cures up a little bit, so you might get a few more years out of it. Not much. It's just not designed to be painted. It's like painting that white oak lentil bean. You know, it's just not gonna, it's just not gonna work. And all this treated lumber really ticks me off because treated lumber is, first of all, the lowest quality southern yellow pine you can get. Mm -hmm. right. Then they dry it down to 18%. So stuff that comes into the lumber yard is supposed to, by industry standards, be 18% moisture or below. And when a big load of two by whatever comes in, we call that a bunk. It's all banded together. And I'll go up and test it, and none of it's even close to 18%. And this is non-treated. So they, they treat, they dry the wood down to around 18%, but then they put it on uh, on trucks and, and trains, and it's exposed, and by the time it gets to the lumber yard, it's like 25% moisture. <laughs> treated, they dry down to 18 and then they pressure treat it, which drives moisture into it, and they don't re-dry it. Yeah, it's wet when you get so it. So it is so wet right? that I have actually yeah. had treated 
lumber squirt me in the eye when I'm cutting it with a circular stuff. Don't they treat it now with salt brine? Salt brine is another way to do it. And there are companies that are now re-drying treated lumber, but it's a third more expensive. Oh. <laughs> when you build your whole all that Her board, she redid her whole, she's got this huge, you know, Queen Anne Victorian. She just redid the whole wrap I saw a picture porch. of it. And that was all done with exposed treated lumber, not wrapped with something else? Yeah. No, the, the decking on the porch is treated lumber. Which way does it run? From the house out. Good, well that's, they got that right. Oh my God! Uh, no, that? no, that is the right way to do it. Oh. You don't want it running parallel to the front of the house because the water runs away from the house. Yeah. Right. So they got that right, but treated lumber won't hold paint. You're, you're, you're going to be painting that constantly. I haven't painted it. So you just left it raw? Yeah. You could. You could. That's use bad stain. too. Well, isn't no, it? no. You <laughs> could use it. You could use an oil penetrating uh, stain from like Cabot. But you can't yeah, paint that. It, it, yeah, it's just not going to hold up. Cabot is a great company, old New England company. Designs, and you know, when they quit geez, making var exactly. floor varnish at Benjamin Moore, I mean, you can bear, there's a company called Sunderland, not Sutherland, but Sunderland Wells online that makes all these uh, uh, fabulous old varnish. Some of them are mixed with a little bit of poly. Some of them are, uh, are, are uh, tongue oil. Mm -hmm. um, and they make some incredible uh, exterior uh, porch decking kinds of paints and floor paints and, and clear finishes and stuff like that. The most of the varnishes are gone. And so I, I was just bereft because I've been using Benjamin Moore's long oil uh, floor finishes for years and I never use anything over satin. That's a big mistake people make. They go in, they go semi-gloss and gloss. And what happens when you walk into a room with a semi-gloss or gloss finish on it? You see the gloss. You don't see the luster in the wood. So I always use a satin. You don't want to go much below a satin because, because the sheen actually helps harden the finish a little bit. So if you go below a satin to like a flat or that kind of thing, it's not as durable and it'll scratch up easier. Um, but we've tried all these different polys. I mean, there's Minwax, all these different polys, and then Benja, or, or, or Cabot had this great poly that didn't didn't fade out with a rug on it, and it, it looked like hand rubbed oil, and it was satin, and I was using it in all these floors, and, and six months ago, they it's quit making it. So I went online and bought out every single paint store that had it on their shelves. So like, I was, um, yeah, wood, wood floor restoration is a, is a whole other thing. Uh, that, this is not about that, but it, 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 it's all about finishes, right? And, and on interior wood floors, you know, we talk about 15% for paint on the outside. You don't want your, your floors to be over 12%. Somewhere between 8 and 12% is the sweet spot for hardwood floors or, or, or softwood floors. That you're putting down for putting finishes down. How do you feel about mixing shellac flakes to do beams and trim inside of a house? And yeah, using so South Carolina a lumber yard that was started up in 1727 went out of business in 1983, <laughs> and they had an on-site auction, and I drove down there and I bought a 50-gallon oak barrel full of shellac flakes. Wow. I still have some. And I mix my own shellac all the time. Yeah. Shellac is the most maligned finish on the planet. Everybody quit using shellac because it made rings, Jeez. water rings and stuff like that. But the truth is, is that it is the only finish, I don't care if it's latex, water-based, oil-based, that has no petroleum in it. It is the only natural finish completely 100%. It's made with bug resin yep. and corn alcohol. Yep. And that's what shellac is. Yeah. In fact, your I Snickers don't... bar has shellac all over it. That's what they put on them to make them shiny. And they really break it. Corn what? Alcohol. Yeah, I, I love shellac. I, I do too. I I've can't. mixed it. Yeah. I won't buy a can of shellac because you don't know how old that is. But if you mix your own flakes, 
then you can get the color you like. It's right. orange, brown. Yeah, they call it cut. So the more right. you I was put gonna in, ask the, the, difference the heavier the cut. So the shellac, so the, the lac bug in Indonesia, now, Indonesia, you know, Thailand, Vietnam, all these different Indonesian areas have these rainforests with these trees that the lac bug likes to go into. And of course, they've been burning them down and cutting them down for cattle farming so that the largest producer of shellac in the, in the world is a company called Zinzer. Yep, Z that's what I buy. Right. Yep. They are buying remaining rainforest to keep the Indonesian keep people from, from cutting them down or burning them down because that's the only source of the lac bug oh in the world. <laughs> so it goes up into the tree, it lays its larva, and it secretes this orange resin around the larva, and then the lac bug dies. So it's giving its life like a lemon to be the finish on your woodwork. And then that gets mixed with denatured alcohol. And, uh, and so I can take a big jar, and I can put a bunch of denatured alcohol and put a whole bunch of shellac flakes. If I want it darker, I add more flakes. And if I want it lighter, I put in less flakes. Just like you're saying, and it dissolves the mm -hmm. shellac flakes uh, pretty quickly. You know, sometimes it can take four or five days, but I put it in the sun, so it's bound to blow up the house. You know. Like, <laughs> yeah, if you get those rings, all you have to do is take the natured alcohol yeah. and rub yeah. it back out. Yeah, or even uh, another uh, coat of little, shellac. Uh, so, so here's the one thing about denatured alcohol: you can strip shellac with denatured alcohol, so you have to be a little mm -hmm. bit careful mm -hmm. about that. What I found. If you get a ring in shellac, I take four out steel wool and, and lemon oil, mm. and it makes the ring go away without taking the sheen off, mm. off of the shellac. I did. A, I testify in court a lot as an expert witness, and it's almost 90% of the time it's in new construction. So some lawyer hires a guy to build his house. The the, the pre-finished hardwood flooring company says you cannot lay this on OSB, it has to be laid on plywood. It gets laid on OSB and it starts squeaking because the OSB doesn't hold the nails or the, or, or the staples, uh, resin coated staples that they use well enough. And, and the, the lawyer then sues the builder and then I have to go in and testify. One, one of the strangest ones I ever did was this lady had this arts and crafts house with red gum wood. Now gum was the great faker. You could take gum trees and you could fake walnut, cherry, all, I, I can't tell you how many houses I've gone into and people say, you should come and see my, my walnut woodwork. And I, and I always have you know, a beautiful woodwork, but it's not walnut, it's red, it's sweet red gum. Um, and she had this beautiful figure, sweet red gum, and it was all finished with shellac. Just gorgeous. She hired Mary Maids, and they came in and they wiped it all down with Murphy's oil soap oh. and Murphy's oil soap is full of alcohol and it took the sheen off all of the woodwork in the house oh. and Mary Maids had to pay to have that all redone oh my God. Uh, and I guess they don't use Murphy's oil soap anymore. <laughs> I don't ever use Murphy's oil soap I oh never wax God. floors either waxing <laughs> floors is really right? tough because if you wax a floor the wax can get down into the grooves you can get deep into the grain, and if you ever want to put a, a varnish or, or a, some sort of surface finish on it, you know, fish eye, what's called fish eye, where the finish won't, won't adhere to the waxy areas, so I try to avoid it. Now, at Mount Vernon, the floors never had finished, they just had carnauba wax put on the floors. That's always going to be carnauba wax, but they have to go through every two to three years and re wax all those floors, and then eventually they have to strip it off and re wax them again. It's like uh, oil finishes on floors. Mm. So Watco Danish oil is a great product. Yeah. Um, it actually it, it polymerizes the surface of the wood, hardens the wood a little bit on the surface, soaks in, and and, and if you it, it, you know it's nice. But if you you have to redo it every two to three years if you do that, mm -hmm. and that just is a lot of labor that most homeowners are not going to do. It's just not going to happen. Mm. So in my business. Especially when I'm promoting different ways of doing things that, that, that pop up as being the best of, the, of all the methods. We also have to think about how people live today. So, can you live in a museum house? Well, we have one in Hannibal called Rockcliffe. It's rotting from the, inside, from the outside in. They've never touched it. The roof leaks, but they've spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on interior 
which doesn't make any sense to me at all. But anyway, Rockcliffe is fabulous. It has all its original furniture, Tiffany glass stained windows. It was built just after the turn of the 20th century. The biggest robber baron mansion in Hannibal. And it's all the, the bus tours go through it. It's also a bed and breakfast. And so we get a lot of guests that come and stay at our place because they stayed in that house one night and they're like, oh, it was really weird, man. <laughs> Staying in a museum, I couldn't do it. So they canceled the next two nights and come and stay with them. But you can't live in a museum, right? So you have to respect the architecture. But you also have to understand how people live. And so in, in, in the... Uh, the houses that I redevelop it and turn from slumlord apartment houses back into single families and then I sell them. I don't like being a landlord, so I don't like to hold houses, so I don't do a lot of historic tax credits. Because if you do one, you have to hold the property sometimes seven years. It depends on where we are at any given moment. And I don't want to do that. I like to get them done and sell them. They usually sell before I ever get them done because you develop a reputation in the community and people you know that love old houses but don't want to restore know that all the systems are new and we've respected the architecture, so they'll buy them. How do you feel about the spruce for deck quality? Spruce? Yeah, it's nice. It holds the paint nicely. Yeah, yeah. I thought I used on there. I just curious. Yeah, no, spruce is nice. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a really rod resistant uh, uh, softwood and it has some, some density to it. It's not as soft as like cedar or, right, right. or you know, uh, southern yellow yeah. pine, stuff like that. So that's a pretty good should be shot. <laughs> Yes. I have uh, lath and plaster walls, which are um, finely cracked sometimes and have lumps from various paint and everything. And I like a smooth wall. Yeah. What should I do? So. I, I'm prepared to re recoat the plaster if I have to. Sometimes you, 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 can, re you can fill the cracks. And, 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 and recoat it with real plaster. You know, a lot of people are using drywall mud to do this, and it's not. It's, it's not the it's same. It's delicate. It's not the same. Really. So, so, patching plaster? So, every no. single year at my house, we have to go through and patch plaster. Yeah. It's five stories tall. Yeah. It moves. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so, I'm going to get here with <laughs> plaster cracks. And we identify anywhere from six of them to 15 of them every, every, and then in the winter when we don't have as many guests, we go in and we dig them out and we use a church key. Anybody remember what a church yeah. key is? Mm -hmm. Used to open beer cans. And we back cut, like a dovetail, the cracks, and then we backfill it with, you can use lime plaster, but even on a lime plaster wall you can use gypsum plaster to backfill it just below the surface. And uh, Gold Bond makes uh, a bunch of different stuff. A lot of local lumber yards sell Gold Bond products. Yes. You can get uh, lime and or uh, a gypsum plaster. plaster. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then I backfill it with that. So then I use real lime uh, top coat plaster to do that final thing. And, and, and the plasters, and they go away. You can, uh, some people will tape those cracks and, and, and then skim well, then over them with them mud, but the, but the repairs terrible. don't hold up. Uh, because the crack will contract and expand, and the tape will start to bubble and, and that type of thing. So my yeah. my plaster yeah. lath walls have that final skim coat, right, mm -hmm. eighth inch right. thick on it and stuff, and I start scraping that. Like, and I said, well, like I could go on forever yeah. popping that off, yeah. but I guess you just once you get to a point, you say, mm -hmm. okay, well that's it's adhering enough, so right. Must yeah, just yeah, 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 yeah cut your losses because Pandora's <coughs> box is an ugly thing. Yeah. You know? Okay, I need more specifics. So the the lime top coat plaster, yeah, and and gold bond makes that. What gold, is it called? Gold in bond the makes all kinds of plaster products. So you can get top coat. For, uh, they they make a gypsum plaster, which sets hard. You cannot sand any of these. Ah. Oh. They have to you be tool. No. You cannot sand plaster. You gotta really. Uh, you, no. uh, when you say gypsum plaster, is that a distinction from plaster Paris? Yeah, well, plaster of Paris is a lime. Okay. Okay. Uh, Gypsum plaster is plaster made with lime, but you still can't sand that either. Okay. It's it, it's a hard plaster, so we backfill the cracks after we clean them out with the uh, with either lime or gypsum uh, plaster, and it's it's a rough. It's got more sand in it, 
and uh, it comes in dry bags and you mix it with water and you back fill it to just below the surface to about what your layer of most plaster is three coat plaster mm -hmm. not all but most plaster is three coats so you have the first coat is what we call a scratch coat so you put the first coat on and it squeezes between the laths and that keys it in and then you scratch it with a tool and then you put your brown coat on which then is a kind of your leveling coat so that everything gets level and then you put your finished plaster over the top of that in a very thin, it's 16 sometimes yeah. and on top of that. Um, do, you, do you recommend an additive, a latex additive on that stuff to give it a little bit of, uh, you know, I don't elasticity? Use it. I, I, I can't re recommend it because I don't use it, so I can't recommend it. But I have a class at the school this fall with a fourth generation German plaster from oh, St. Louis is oh, teaching a class and really? how to repair plaster. Oh, 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 oh yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I don't have a house you can stay in anymore. <laughs> what if you, uh, I, I need you to stay know more about that. Oh, yeah? Um, when, when is that? Or how do I find out? I think out it's in it? October, but you can go on my... So, so here's, here's the kind. So bobyap.com, B-O-B-Y-A-P-P.com. That's my website. On the website, there's this Belvedere School, my consulting work, all that kind of thing. And access to my blog. My blog is on there, as well as access to my YouTube channel, which is where I'm putting up all my old PBS shows. And I'm ripping off Antiques Roadshow <laughs> because every single time we go in, the show is a half hour and we do a segment, three segments, and then we recap at the end of each segment and talk. If I was in Seattle or in Florida or wherever, in Seattle it costs this much to do this kind of roof. If down in Florida it's this much and this much. But that was back in the 90s. So now it says the last round we put up was this. In 2020, this is how much it costs. So we're doing that kind of thing. Um, and I've got about half the shows up. I have 52 of them. And um, I sold it in syndication when I got out of PBS and, 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 it, and, and it was on Isra Israeli television. Wow. And China, the, the government of China bought the show. <laughs> and I'm I, to the syndicator, I'm like, what? Why would China want to buy it? He said, they sort of think you're like Mark Twain of preservation. That, that you show what the average American is like, and I'm like, ah, oh, that scares the hell out of me. <laughs> Can you plaster over latex paint? No. If you've got a room painted with latex paint, you start getting spider cracks. You can, but you have to use a bonding agent. So you just oh use God. Elmer's glue and water? bonding agent is, is like a glue. Right, Elmer's glue and water, basically. Well, yeah, and some of it's red. The stuff of, yeah, yeah. for plaster top, for skin. Yeah, I don't like it. Yeah, but there's a couple different ones what? out there, and you have to coat the wall with that, and then it, it'll work. Yeah. Then it'll work here. Yeah, because I don't, I mean, because I tried it in the plaster, just because you've had, I've had to feather it into where... <laughs> <laughs> the paint was still there because you can't strip the whole room. I'm in the Quad Cities where I used to live. I'm in Rock Island, Davenport, up in there. They have this thing. Okay, nobody does straight drywall. It's called Calco. And they put up a perforated gypsum board. It was in my house. And, and then they actually staple a fiberglass mesh to it. And then they put two coats of plaster over the top of it. It's fantastic. Yeah, I'm used to that walls like that. Yeah, and, it, and it's hard like plaster. And, yeah. Uh, I mean, they do it everywhere up there. I've never been in a community where they were doing it. Most communities, they put up drywall and they just tape the joints and yeah. feather them out and go. Um, like they do in Hannibal. I've got a drywall crew, uh, second generation Mexican Americans. <laughs> And they're fast and they, they rock on the stilts and they don't mind doing 12-foot wow. ceilings and, and uh, I gut ceilings a lot because ceilings are gravity plus I need to run new systems and having that floor joist open uh, helps me get that in there. You'll like my schoolhouse then because <laughs> I have no ceiling. <laughs> Same here. I'm not kidding. Yeah, like mm -hmm. Southwest, uh, no, no, tell us about it. Oh. It's um, well, it's got a what's it called again? Diamond stand up, sorry, diamond trowel plaster. Yeah, yeah, in yeah. Santa Fe, yeah. you know, all the yeah. houses have it, and then they do they do uh, chicken wire on yeah. the wall, yep, 
And then they do a base coat, yep. round coat type That's of what thing. I had in my house. Mm -hmm. And then you get Structolite. Yep. The, Mica. You get that plaster with the little balls in it, the white perlite. Mm -hmm. And you slap it on there and get it looking all right. But before it fully dries, you get out a uh, water sprayer. You spray it and then you just trowel it. Trowel it. Smooth. Back and forth. I mean, you burnish it. Yeah, because yes. you, you, you can't oh. sand it. Right? So, so they have the plasters. I mean, the plaster in my house is like marble. Yeah, it they can be. burnished it. Or like you Venetian know, like plaster. Finish it like a swirly. Oh my God. Yeah, yeah. love that. Start the light, you can sand. And these drywall oh, guys that put yeah, texture on sand the run away. If, they're, if these guys are insisting that they put a texture on your drywall, it's because they don't know how to tape joints. That's right. me. You know? That's my problem. Right Old now. houses, now there are some exceptions. Some Tudor style houses, some arts and crafts style houses had some texture in their original plaster. But most old houses and buildings had smooth, burnished plaster walls. You know? I mean, it was, a, it was a thing. Now, the other thing that's really interesting to me <coughs> is that before about 1870s, natural woodwork was not cool at all. You were only cool if you could afford to hire a faux painter to paint your woodwork to look like some exotic wood. And uh, my house it has, you know, Cuban mahogany. When I bought that barrel of shellac flakes in, in, in South Carolina at that auction, I also bought 900 board feet of Cuban mahogany. Now, there hasn't been Cuban mahogany since the late 1800s. Blights, over logging, gone. And, and I design it, I build reproduction furniture for capital buildings. Apparently, legislators are thieves, and they steal the deacons' benches, benches and the rotundas and the legislators' desks. And so I, I got into this niche where I'm designing, I have to match the carvings to the depths and everything like that, and they wanted me to use the same wood, and a lot of that stuff was made in the mid-1800s out of Cuban mahogany, which was the first real and true mahogany. Now, then it was Honduran, which was really nice, not quite as nice as, as Cuban. That's gone, and it's illegal to log in, in, in Honduras now. Now we're going to African mahogany. And African mahogany is close, but it's not nearly as good. Cuban mahogany is what all those New England, John got. Whenever you watch the Antiques Roadshow and the Kino twins, yeah. you know, I love it when the, the guy brings in a stickly sideboard and he's refinished it and he's so proud of it. And they're like, oh, well, you moron, if you had to <laughs> yeah. Well, we've learned from the Antiques Roadshow that original finishes are important. That's why I don't sand floors. Some people have learned. If no. Grandma rocked in Tough front of the, uh, the fireplace for 20 years and there's two ruts, I don't want to grind that out of there. Uh, that's part of the history of the floor. Right. Yeah. Let's eat lunch.